So this is from a book by a guy called Tufter, which you don't actually need to read. Um, he espouses a number of principles which people preparing statistical uh, graphics should be aware of. Um, these four I would like to speak a little bit to. Um, and to my mind, one really key one is uh, to show the data as they are, not your spin on them. Now, it is in reality very difficult to be completely unbiased as a researcher because you do have opinions, you have a brain, you have motivation for doing the study. But it's equally important to think about presenting the data in an unbiased way uh, rather than directing the reader too much towards your own conclusion. And that links with the second highlighted point to avoid distorting the data's message. And again, it's very hard to do that, even unconsciously sometimes to do that, because you're sure the key message in your data are X, and so you want X to be very prominent, which might unintentionally make other aspects less prominent and uh, direct the reader's attention towards a particular part of the data rather than the whole picture. The third one is to achieve information density, which means to use the space on your graph efficiently to convey as much information as possible. Of course, that's without making the graph so cluttered that it's difficult to read. And then finally, I would say a graphic should serve a clear purpose. And I've been in lots of conversations around journal manuscripts being prepared where someone says we should have a graph, we should have a scatter plot or a error bar chart or something like that. And my problem with that idea is that, yes, graphics are visually interesting. They can make a paper look more attractive to a reader, but they still need to serve a very clear purpose rather than just being there for their visual appeal. Um, in terms of information density, here's a couple of contrasting examples. Doesn't matter so much what the example is, but we have generation time of species on the horizontal axis, length on the vertical axis. And I quite like this graph because I think it achieves that idea of information density without being confusing. The authors have put the data points themselves in a dark black ink, so they stand out quite clearly, um, despite this text on the um, graph as well. Um, but the text does add information. It tells you what, which species each dot represents, such as here, B. So I quite like this graph. It's not too cluttered. The information which is there is all useful. In contrast to this graph, which perhaps actually conveys less objective information, but does it in a much clear, much less clear fashion. And what's happened here is that the, these uh, fine grid lines and background shading have been added, probably to help guide the eye and to provide some uh, contrast. But in fact, they, they lose contrast because these little dark black dots here uh, merge sorry, merge with the background too much, and the background itself uh, conveys no information at all. This is a less extreme example, um, graphing age at first episode of major depression versus Hamilton score at discharge from a psychiatric unit. The graph itself is interesting. The message from the graph is perhaps not as clear as it could be, these grid lines have been added. You see it every uh, five and then 2.5 points on the Hamilton score, but there are so many of them that the grid lines themselves become distracting. In contrast to this graph, which is the same data, but where the grid lines only indicate the means of each variable on the horizontal and vertical axis. So what this meeting of these two grid lines tells you is the centroid of the graph. The average person um, was around uh, 35 or so years of age and had a Hamilton score at discharge of around 26. And people up in this direction are increasingly unusual in terms of age and high discharge scores and likewise down here. So I think that these two lines actually convey some useful reference information for the reader, but uh, do not clutter up the graph in the process. So the summary of uh, this uh, lecture overall is 
going back to the start is to never let never lose sight of the science behind your research. So the hypothesis test to be conducted properly uh, is important, their interpretation is important, but don't become fixated with hypothesis tests. The science is the important thing, not the statistics. It's there just to help you um, understand the science behind what your data are telling you. Allied to that is the need to combine uh, psychological theory uh, plus the hypothesis test, plus some idea of effect size to usefully evaluate your hypothesis. So the best scientific papers will triangulate what's known theoretically with empirically what we find, both in terms of the effect size and the hypothesis test result. Then we talked a little bit about the linking between research design and hypothesis testing, and these two things are intimately interlinked, which we will talk about in more detail in future units. But that's a really important concept to keep in your head, is that we need to uh, think about uh, selecting hypothesis tests, which both match the design of our study and also the nature of our data. And then finally, on the last part of this lecture, doing the research is great, uh, but it doesn't really help a lot if we don't convey what we've found in a clear, unbiased fashion to the readers of our reports or our journal article. So thinking about displays, be it graphic as I've talked about here, or tabular or in text, the same principles apply that displaying it efficiently in an unbiased fashion which your readers will understand readily is critically important. Great, thanks for your time.